it reads differently to different people from the river to the sea. Um, the contention is that this this is a call for a kind of anti-colonial expulsion, right? Similar to like Algeria kicking out the French, right? Like get out of here, go back to wherever you came from. This is the, how it's heard, I think, to a lot of Jewish ears. Yeah, a lot of Jewish ears. That you know how the Jewish ears are. That's how it's heard, don't you know? Our news media. What are we going to do with them? I have an idea, but it may not be the best idea. Might not be very popular for now. Been a long time since I rock and roll. Oh, yeah, I want to get to our... Uh, Our Baltimore criminal Democrat story. Could you narrow it down a little bit? Oh, I think I can. You know, in addition to um, all of the madness the Democrats are inflicting, the murders, the mayhem, the carjackings, the lootings, the, the crime wave across the country, the street violence, the mob, street political violence, the mob, street, crystal-knocked, anti-Semitic violence, the torturing college students on college campuses because they're Jewish violence. They, they like to say silence is violence. That's, that's not typically true. Uh, violence is violence, though, and uh, they're good at that. I'll, uh, I'll give them that. That's for sure. But um, you may remember a woman in Baltimore, Marilyn Mosby, the longtime prosecutor of Bodymore Murderland. And uh, she's the one that, uh, after Freddie Gray, the uh, local neighborhood heroin dealer, was chased down by the police and threw himself out of the third story of a warehouse building in Baltimore and was then arrested. And the Democrats tried to blame the police. He was apparently injured, and Freddie Gray, the local neighborhood a uh, heroin dealer died after being arrested, after fleeing the police. And by the way, it was the husband of an elected Democrat in Baltimore that insisted the police come to this intersection to take care of the heroin dealers there, but, but pay no attention to that. Six Baltimore police officers were arrested and charged with horrible crimes for murdering the heroin dealer because they love the heroin dealer and they hate the police. To the people of Baltimore and the demonstrators across America, I heard your call for no justice, no peace. Your peace is sincerely needed as I work to deliver justice on behalf of this young man. Riots were going on, Democrats were looting and plundering, and that's, that's uh, wasn't, it, was, it was the mayor, I think, who said that, the Democrat mayor who said they needed space to express themselves while they were rioting and looting and burning and the city of Baltimore, over the heroin dealer being uh, killed tragically uh, while being arrested for being a heroin dealer and, you know, having a uh, lifetime of crime. We uh, tried to make sure that they were protected from the cars and the other, you know, things that were going on. Um, We also gave those who wished to destroy space to do that as well. They gave those who wished to destroy Stephanie Rawlings Blake, uh, the Democrat, then Democrat mayor of uh, Bodymore Murderland. And uh, they gave the rioters space to express themselves and destroy private businesses and private property, uh, attack the police and commit arson and uh, mob violence and looting and so on. And then they arrested six police officers, uh, four of whom I think four, three or four of them were officers of color. That's OOC according to the Democrats, officers go, you know, women of color, W-O-C, people of color, P-O-C. So these must be P-O-O-C, Pook, they're Pook, uh, police officers of color. They arrested six police officers and they charged them with uh, horrible, terrible crimes because the heroin dealer died of his injuries after fleeing the police, jumping out of a building. And remember they said they give him a rough ride and bounced him around in the back of the... Uh, the paddy wagon, which is a racial slur against the Irish people, but that's okay. And uh, and then all six of the police officers were acquitted, but they were charged with, uh, you know, being murderers and uh, stuff. And because the Democrats, the Democrats, and uh, they were all they were all acquitted. And that was good news for civilization. That was in 2017 that they were acquitted. 
the riots and Freddie Gray, was that 2015, uh, 2016? But the Democrats tried to lynch the six police officers because they are in bed with the heroin dealers. 2015, 2015, that the Freddie Gray, and it was a sad story. His life is a sad story. But uh, the six police officers were eventually acquitted, even though this woman uh, tried to have them all lynched, Marilyn Mosby. And they're all in bed with one another and their husbands and they're, you know, they're all, they're all elected Democrats. And Freddie Gray's, you know, neck was injured and and they claimed that it happened in the back of the police transport wagon, which is, of course, uh, the paddy wagon. 25-year-old heroin dealer uh, handcuffed. And they made up this whole story, and it was all BS. Uh, but they tried to lynch them all. And uh, the six officers were eventually acquitted because even the jury in Baltimore said, you know, this is a lot of hooey. And it was all a fake story. Uh, and the Democrats, you know. Now the headline today is former Baltimore prosecutor Marilyn Mosby found guilty on two counts of perjury, but there are more crimes in the pipeline having to do with Marilyn Mosby because she's an elected Democrat. Former Baltimore prosecutor Marilyn Mosby found guilty on two counts of perjury. A federal jury reached the verdict Thursday. And that's big news. The former Baltimore City state's attorney Marilyn Mosby has been convicted on two counts of perjury by a federal jury. The federal jury reached a verdict Thursday finding Mosby guilty of perjury after she falsely claimed financial hardship during the COVID-19 pandemic. In order to withdraw money from the city's retirement fund, prosecutors said. And it turns out she faces a maximum sentence now of five years in prison for each of the two perjury counts, U.S. District Judge Lydia K. Grigsby hasn't scheduled a sentencing hearing yet. Mosby initially pleaded not guilty to the charges, which alleged that the former prosecutor falsely claimed financial hardship during the COVID pandemic in order to withdraw $90,000 from her city retirement accounts. She then used those phones those funds for down payments on two vacation properties in Florida. Mosby lost re-election bid in 2022, uh, defense attorney uh, to defense attorney Ivan Bates. Now, she took the money out. She received a full salary, uh, $247,955.58 in 2020, which is the year in which she claimed financial hardship and withdrew the money from her retirement account Uh, According to federal prosecutors, the trial was delayed in February after Mosby's uh, entire defense team quit. That's never a good sign when your entire defense team quits. And she walked out of the federal courthouse in Greenbelt, Maryland, following the verdict. Mosby said, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. That's uh, very nice. She also faces two additional counts of making false mortgage applications in a pending federal case, which relates to the purchase of two Florida vacation homes, more false statements. You know, uh, Democrats, they go to law school and they get government positions. And a trial date has not yet been set for those two additional federal charges making false mortgage statements. What is it that President Trump is on trial for again in New York City um, for allegedly overvaluing his properties uh, while the prosecutors are undervaluing his properties? <laughs> if convicted of making false mortgage application uh, uh, applications, Mosby faces a maximum sentence of 30 years in prison for each of the two counts. Five years in prison for the two counts on which she was convicted yesterday, an additional 30 years in prison for each of the two counts uh, there. Now, that is a pretty crazy story, I've got to say. But, and I, you know, it sounds like they're not the most enormous crimes, but these are the laws on the books, and you're the prosecutor, and and you tried to lynch those six police officers in the name of Freddie Gray, the local heroin dealer, who had the police sicked on him by another elected Democrat. And then when the police went to arrest the local heroin dealer and he fled and jumped out of a building, he was injured and he died of his injuries later. Um, your Democrat Party. Your Democrat Party. 
I'm telling you. Yes, sir. Now, so much more to get to. I think I should take another. Oh, wait, before I do, I've got to, uh, I've, I, I got to, because our friends, our friends uh, with the annual Danish Christmas Bazaar, the annual Danish Christmas Bazaar, that's right, which is tomorrow. And these are great people, the great, uh, the wonderful people who put on the Danish Christmas Bazaar. And a great man came by yesterday, uh, 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 born in Denmark, uh, Danish parents, came to the United States, United States Marine. Uh, he's running the operation, wonderful man. And, uh, and here's why we, we love them in part, because every year when they're having the annual Danish Bazaar, they contribute a good sum of money to our friends at Fisher House. Fisher House, they're big supporters of Fisher House. We're big supporters of Fisher House, and, uh, and we love Fisher House. And the, the Danish Club of Washington, D.C. presents their 60th annual Danish Christmas Bazaar. That is tomorrow from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at St. Elizabeth's Church. Uh, it's uh, 917 Montrose Road in Rockville, Maryland. And they've got all kinds of great stuff. Great food, the Danish delicatessen, Christmas decorations, the Little Mermaid, you know, fed embroidery and crafts, Danish pastries and cookies and a restaurant and carry out food. And it's just, it's a wonderful group of people sponsored by the Royal Danish Embassy. And they've got a raffle and all kinds of things. And we love them because, first of all, it's a great event and they're wonderful people. And it's their 60th annual. And they support Fisher House. So if you can, it's a Veterans Day, wonderful people. Uh, and uh, St. Elizabeth's Church on Montrose Road in Rockville for the 60th annual Danish Christmas Bazaar and Festival for all kinds of good stuff. And we salute them, and uh, we love them. We've been working with them for years and years, and they've been giving money, giving money to Fisher House for years and years. So I want to thank them for their support of Fisher House and, um, and the Marine Corps. Uh, it's great, wonderful organization. So I want to thank them and, uh, and help support them as well. Now, let's go to another telephone call. Look at my clock. Let's go to Sally calling from Strasburg, Virginia, en route to Williamsburg. Sally, you're on the Chris Plant Show. Hello. Hello, How Sally. It's so- Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can. Loud and clear, Sally. Terrific. Uh, great to talk with you. Uh, uh, many weeks ago, you were talking about your experience uh, flying in the A6 Intruder aircraft. Yes. Uh huh. That's correct. My, yes, my father was a pilot in the A6 Intruder, a graduate of the Naval Academy, and a proud, proud serving um, American aviator. Um, and it was so great to hear you talk about that experience since he, I, I think he discussed it a lot with friends and buddies and whatnot, but at the dinner table, we were not privy to the excitement of what that actually would feel like to <laughs> be in that aircraft. So I uh, wanted to say thank you for sharing that with your audience and giving me a, another insight into my um, my dad's world. We lost him last February, uh, not this last year, but a year ago, almost two years. So um it really meant a lot to us, and we certainly wanted to say thank you for that. Well, that is great, Sally. I, I, I appreciate your calling in with that. That's uh, Father, U.S. Naval Academy, A-6 guy. That is a, it's a medium bomber, flies off of aircraft carriers. He was a Vietnam War guy, was he? Yes. Um, Commander Tom Woodka, they called him Woo-Woo for short. <laughs> Woo-Woo, call sign Woo-Woo. That's great. That is great stuff. Yeah, the A-6, uh, medium bomber, aircraft carrier-based uh, uh, Navy uh, aircraft. And, and I did have the opportunity to fly aboard um, a uh, fly on an A-6 intruder flying off the aircraft carrier, the USS Enterprise, which I thought was just great. Did uh, three cats yeah. and three traps, you know, launched off the deck three times and, and came back and landed an equal number of times, which is, uh, you know, a good thing. And, uh, I, you know, an amazing airplane. Uh, and, uh, and it is, boy, it's tough. I tell you, you go flying off the front of that aircraft, aircraft carrier in an A-6, and it drops off. It's a big, heavy airplane, uh, medium bomber. And uh, you sit side by side, uh, the pilot and yeah. the bombardier in an A-6 intruder. 
and it is, uh, boy, it, it, you know, it ain't no pointy nose fighter plane. You know, this is a, a rough and tumble, tough airplane with a round nose, and and you, it's such a heavy plane that when you go off the deck of the uh, of the aircraft carrier, you drop down toward the water, uh, and it's kind of surprising, yeah. Sally, how close you get to the water as you're powering up. Uh, it's a heck of an airplane, Sally. Well, thank you so much for sharing all your and giving um, supporting our veterans. You know, we wouldn't be anywhere without them. That is a fact, Sally. Uh, God bless. I'm saluting you. Woo woo, woo woo. That's good stuff, <laughs> Commander. Naval Academy, A6 Intruder. God bless. Hey, it's Chris Plant. Excited to tell you about our July 2024 Listener Sea Cruise. We'll be sailing around the British Isles, visiting Scotland and Ireland. Please join us. Book by this July 31st for extra savings. Visit ChrisPlantCruise.com. There's a, a, a bit more very noteworthy military news today and that is um, one of the great Apollo astronauts one of our great astronauts died um, at the age of 95 Frank Borman Frank Borman Apollo astronaut uh, 95 years old these guy is a an Air Force pilot and uh, and uh, the first guy to take laps around the moon right he was the first guy Take laps from Apollo astronaut Colonel Frank Borman, United States Air Force, commanded the first mission to orbit the moon, has died in Billings, Montana. NASA announced he was 95 years old. Today, we remember remember one of NASA's best, astronaut Frank Borman, true American hero. Among his many accomplishments, he served as the commander of the Apollo 8 mission. That's just one of his many accomplishments, the Apollo 8 mission. Died on November 7th, according to a statement put out. During the Apollo 8 mission in 1968, Borman and his crewmates Jim Lovell and William Anders became the first people to orbit the moon and witness Earth rise. First people in the history of the world to witness Earth rise because he took a lap around the moon, you know, about 238, 240,000 miles away. For the first time, the crew snapped a photograph of our planet as it rose above the desolate, scarred lunar surface, resulting in an iconic photo that has left an indelible mark on the public consciousness. And that is true. If you saw the photo, you'd say, oh, yeah, that photo. By Christmas Eve of that year, the Apollo 8 crew dispatched a message back to Earth. This is Apollo 8 coming to you live from the moon. Borman announced after activating a small handheld TV camera and showed viewers what the moon looked like from space. Also the first people to see the dark side of the moon in the history of humankind. 95 years old, a great and amazing generation of American heroes. Frank Borman, Godspeed. It is the Marine Corps birthday today. Tomorrow is Veterans Day. Today is the Marine Corps birthday. Raise a glass today and tomorrow. You know, if you're not Mormon or anything. Yes, we wouldn't want that. Mitt Romney wouldn't have, uh, he can't raise a glass to anybody. I was reading about Frank Borman. Frank Borman, the astronaut, and I stumbled across kind of a funny thing after leaving NASA. The space agency, Frank Borman, became vice president at Eastern Airlines, Eastern Airlines. And they point out that Eastern Airlines um, had had once been led by World War I flying ace Eddie Rickenbacker. Eddie Rickenbacker, famous World War I flying ace. And uh, it's kind of crazy because I was talking to my cousin, Nanette, yesterday about this. Our, uh, our grandfather was in business with Eddie Rickenbacker, and they used to race cars together. They were, Eddie Rickenbacker became a race car driver, and my grandfather was a race car driver and uh, went into the automobile business with Eddie Rickenbacker. And uh, it's just kind of peculiar that it's in there because I had been talking to my cousin about Eddie Rickenbacker and our grandfather yesterday. A little peculiar. Ain't that peculiar? 
Yes, sir. Now, there is a uh, there is a crazy story out there that uh, there's a lot of aviation in my family's uh, background, a lot of aviation. Maybe one of the reasons I'm crazy about airplanes. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's just coincidence. I don't know. But there is a uh, there's a wacky story, a wacky story going around that um, there is a a YouTube guy, a YouTube guy who goes by the name Mr. Beast. Have you ever heard of this guy, Mr. Beast? Mr. Beast apparently has more than 200 million followers on YouTube. And he's a 25-year-old guy from Wichita, Kansas, who is a YouTube giant. And his, uh, his thing, he loves to give money away. He's 25 years old. He's making crazy amounts of money, like $10 million a month or something like that. Right. And uh, so he likes he's an American. He's from Wichita, Kansas. So he likes to give money away and to do good deeds with his earnings, which I think he kind of feels like, you know, come along very, uh, very easily to him. And one of his projects, one of his latest projects is that he he took some money. He went to Africa and got some equipment and he learned that there are. There are water problems in many countries in Africa, many villages in Africa. So he decided he's going to drill 100 wells so that he can give fresh water to a half million people. You just witnessed a small village in Kenya get access to unlimited clean drinking water in less than a second. One down, 99 more wells in Africa to go. You're going to love this video. Combined, these 100 wells are going to give around half a million people fresh water to drink. Now, why would Kenya not already have fresh water for their people? It's the 21st century. And uh, Mr. Beast, 25-year-old guy from America, um, YouTube He's a YouTube sensation, right? And uh, and he so he went and and he and he makes videos. Jimmy Donaldson is his name, James Donaldson. And Jimmy Donaldson went and he makes these videos and he posts them on YouTube, and then he monetizes that and he makes ten million dollars a month. And he's like, wow, I'm 25 years old. I'm going to do good deeds with this stuff. And he makes videos of him doing good deeds and he and he makes fun of stuff. And the 25-year-old Jimmy Donaldson, a.k.a. Mr. Beast. One of the teachers showed me where the students currently get their water, which is from this river. That's extremely unsafe to drink. This is where your students used to get water from? Yes. This is crazy. Yeah. You know, students complaining of diarrhea, infections like typhoid, because this is the water we've been using. At least for this village, we're going to put an end to it right now. So a 25-year-old guy from Wichita, Kansas, who has a YouTube thing. I've never seen it before I discovered this thing. He uh, drills 100 wells in uh, Cameroon and Kenya and Somalia and Uganda and Zimbabwe because in the 21st century, their governments, federal, local, regional, can't give them fresh water. So 25-year-old Jimmy from Wichita comes in and gives them fresh water. After the water comes out of the ground, it's fed into enormous barrels like this one. And once they're built into the water towers, all of the neighboring villages will not only have clean drinking water, but a pressurized water source as well, which in short means no more doing laundry and unsafe water. And the kids are dying of typhoid and diphtheria and the, you know, the diarrhea their whole lives. And, and they got to walk miles with buckets of water that weigh 40 pounds and they're going up hills and he's showing all this stuff. And I'm like, you know, hey, Africa, uh, join us here in the 21st century. Uh, how about that? That's uh, it's completely nuts. So I watched this 10 minute video this morning and it's kind of fun to watch. Uh, but of course, he's being attacked. He's being attacked and they're they're now the lefties are threatening to cancel him. You know why? Because he's white. That's why. Because he's white. And they're accusing him of being white, which he is. And they're uh, saying that he's going to be canceled uh, for his latest project in Africa where hundreds of villages and a half million Africans are going to have fresh water, which they should have had long ago. But you got crook corrupt dictators all over the place and they steal all the money and then nobody gets fresh water and all the kids die of diphtheria and uh, ABC News doesn't cover it because they don't care because that whole thing about caring about children in the Gaza or whatever is just a lot of hooey. But uh, it's uh, pretty amazing 
being attacked. And there's this guy who's uh, an African guy. He lives in Canada now. He posted, and there are a bunch of people who are attacking him, Africans, who are attacking him, saying, hey, I've been working on getting wells in Africa for 15 years, and this white guy walks in, and in no time at all, there are 100 wells, and a half million people have fresh water, and he's resentful. These people are resentful of the white guy, 25-year-old Wichita, Kansas guy, uh, who comes in and gives them fresh water, lickety-split, as Chaz Bono would say. The biggest YouTuber in the world, Mr. Beast, just posted a video of him digging a hundred wells in Africa. And I got to say, as an African myself, I'm not impressed because I am sick and tired of watching these palm-colored influencers using African villages as a stage for their white savior propaganda. Issues like poverty, disease, and bad drinking water are not exclusive to African regions. Flint, Michigan is a good example of an American city that got all three of those things. But Mr. Beast made the intentional choice to go to an African village to make a big show of his great humanitarianism. Why? Because Western society is so conditioned to thinking of the entire continent of Africa as being beneath them that they will see no problem with people like Mr. Beast exploiting the images of children for financial gain and for an ego boost. And I know in his heart he thinks he's doing the right thing, but with as big of a platform as he has, he's actually propagating imagery that says Western society is higher, African society is lower, and they need our help. And if history has told us anything, we know for a fact that, um... Your help doesn't help. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Well, you know, I've uh, got to say, a 25-year-old guy from um, Wichita, Kansas, just came in and gave fresh, clean water to a half million people in hundreds of villages in, what, five different African countries. Um, and, And your takeaway from that is, you damn Westerners think you're better than everybody else? And you cite Flint, Michigan, where Democrats up and down the chain there botched their water supply. It's true for a little while, and the Democrats should be held accountable for that, but they they weren't and they won't be. Uh, and now here's a nice young, he's a liberal, he's a lefty, he's a white kid, he's from Wichita, and he just performed a miracle that five national governments in Africa couldn't perform. And so... Um, you know, Mr. African man living in Canada. What are you doing living in Canada? You must think it's better than, than Africa, you, you imperialist. And honestly, it's, uh, you, you attack people for coming in and doing a solid, doing a good deed, and it's really a good deed. It's fresh water and diphtheria and cholera and all kinds of things going away because it was taken out of, I guess, your hands, which is good. And the Flint... Michigan water crisis entirely self-inflicted by Democrat politicians up and down the line, although they eventually tried to blame the Republican governor who had nothing to do with it, but he was the first Republican they could find after going up the chain from the city council to the county council to the state representative to the U.S. representative to the senators. They tried to find a Republican somewhere and there was only one uh, and he was the governor, so they blamed him, even though he had nothing to do with it. But never mind that. That's, that's an amazing story. Mr. Beast, American YouTuber Mr. Beast, and he's being attacked all over the place. Goal to provide clean drinking water to 500,000 people. Activists in Africa say his actions shamed the Kenyan government. It did because they left their people in squalor, even though they've stolen billions of dollars, and helped perpetuate the stereotype that... Africa is dependent on handouts. Well, when you've got clean water for everybody, get back to me. Okay? And uh, can you uh, point me to all of the great accomplishments of uh, Kenya? Kenya? Uh, Where where your your great architecture, the art? Where's your your, uh, St. Peter's Basilica? Where's your Buckingham Palace? Where's your uh, Sistine Chapel? How's your space program going? Uh, you guys get tired of chipping golf balls on the moon more than half a century ago, too? Or is that just us? Show me your architecture. Show me your art. Honestly. Um, you're welcome. <laughs> and, uh, you know, colonialism was so horrible. Uh, was there clean water during colonialism? Was there architecture and engineering, education, language? Written language, please. 
All right. But this is the lefty thing. This is, uh, you know, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is, what else do they, they got that DEI, they got the uh, critical race theory. Um, we got clean water, except where the Democrats uh, screwed up in Flint, Michigan. Every single one of them a Democrat, just saying. Uh, let's go to, uh, let's, uh, you know, I, how much time do I have? How much audio do I have? What do we want to get to? Let's go to, let's go to line seven. Let's go to Bill calling from, what is it, Ulutwa, Tennessee? Bill, you're on the Chris Plant Show. Well, hi, Chris. Hey, I Bill. Guess, uh, after four, uh, it's Uldawa. My it's, apologies. Uh, Uldawa. No problem. It's uh, Cherokee for uh, the owl. The owl. That's cultural it's, appropriation. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're going. It's Cherokee, so I suggested we change the name to Trumpville. <laughs> but uh, I haven't uh, heard back from the city planners. But <laughs> anyway, anyway, I want to tell you about 40 years ago in business, I went to uh, Cambridge and uh, visited Harvard Square, mm-hmm. Harvard and MIT. And I went to uh, Harvard and bought a tie. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, you, you know, after all this Harvard protests, I could maybe – burn that in effigy but you know that wouldn't be cool so (laughs) i've decided to take it down to a homeless shelter and have somebody wear it with a sign that says harvard graduates for hermas (laughs) and uh you know spelling the r backwards in in that so uh and i'm going to send you a copy of that picture and I have it done, and uh, but I also want to tell you that uh, you have filled a slot that uh, I have been lamenting since the death of Rush Limbaugh, and I listen to you every day that I can, and on the podcast, and uh, I think you're such a breath of funny, fresh air. Well, but I do have one. Yes, sir. I do Go have ahead. One question. I do have one question for you. Have you heard about the murder of um, Chris Wright in Chattanooga from somebody from Section 8 Housing? No, I have uh, not. About about six weeks ago. No. Now, if if the roles were reversed, uh, we would have had uh, protests in the streets. Uh, it, it was a black thug that shot him with 66 arrests, and he was vetted to uh, be allowed in Section 8 housing. And uh, so, you know, we need to move these people into place. You know, I I, I joke that if, if I had enough Semtex, I would take care of Patton Towers, but that wouldn't be the Christian thing to do. Right. So I'm not. So I'm not. But... Uh, I, I the, the selective outrage in this country when a good person gets shot, a Jewish person, a uh, you know whoever you know a black conservative, when they get shot, there's no national outrage, and uh, but yet if a thug tries to pull a police officer's gun, or if he's on fentanyl. He'll be a national hero. Right. George Floyd, St. George Floyd of uh, fentanyl. Uh, Boy, a big call, Bill, a big call. I thank you very much uh, for the call. And I just looked up the Daryl Too Tall Roberts uh, murderer of Chris Wright, 66 prior arrests. And you're right, no national media attention. And, uh, you know, back to Harvard for just a moment. He was wearing my Harvard tie. Can you believe it? My Harvard tie. Like, oh, sure, he went to Harvard. I tell you the story that Bill just shared from Tennessee, which we looked up as a truly horrible story. Beginning of October of this year, <clears throat> father of three who was on his way to his high school reunion, murdered by a career criminal who had been arrested 66 times. 
including shooting at people and home invasions and robberies and drugs and all kinds of crimes. This very uh, businessman who was murdered mercilessly by this animal, uh, Christopher Wright, 38 years old, downtown Chattanooga. And uh, Bill is right. Why is uh, George Floyd enough to launch riots from coast to coast, looting and arson and billions in damage and dozens killed and thousands injured? And uh, then a good and decent man with three children, including, what is it, an eight-week-old baby? Just extraordinary. Uh, is murdered by this this career criminal. And our national news media doesn't care, and the politicians don't seem to go, no, this is just another day in Chattanooga. Pay no attention. Of course, we put our criminals back on the street, and it's a racial thing, too, um, but uh, not the right kind of racial thing, right? We live in very corrupt times, very corrupt times indeed. <clears throat> and I'm sorry about that, but Bill, great, uh, great call, and thank you for the nice words, and and for making me aware of this, uh, this incident as well. And, uh, yeah, changing it from a Cherokee name to Trumpville, I think, would be fun. I think that's a fun idea. Uh, listen, have a great um, Veterans Day weekend, and, and God bless the United States Marine Corps. Happy birthday to the United States Marine Corps and to Marines everywhere. 